Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you came across this message. The sermon you are about to watch is from our verse by verse study through the Gospel of Mark. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. My family, my family, what's going on? All right. Happy Father's Day. All my daddies out there, happy Father's Day, man. Thank you. Thanks so thankful for you. Uh, got a quick question to ask you. Ever been going through some of your old stuff? Went across your old class, high school yearbook? Pulled that bad boy out and whew, put the dust off of it? Class of 19. I ain't going to leave it there. I'm going to age y'all. I'm going to age y'all. <laughs> You're going to flip through that yearbook and you go to your, your class and you see the folks you did life with, what you hung out with, you know what I'm saying, those good old memories. You keep on flipping and then you see your exes. And you quickly say, Jesus, thank you that that was not the way I desired to go. Thank you for saving me from that relationship. <laughs> Woo, thank you, God. <laughs> you keep on flipping and you get to the back and most yearbooks have what they call the superlative page, you know, uh, you know, cutest couple, most athletic, most likely to succeed. You know, but simply put, if you're like me, you go through this yearbook and you see all these photos of folks you used to do life with, and you ever ask yourself, I wonder what they're doing now. Ever heard much from anybody else been there before? See an old book, old photo, and go like, I wonder what they're doing now. Where are they now? Well, that's kind of what we find ourselves today. Today, we hop back into the book of Mark, and if you're new to, with us, over the past year, we've walked through verse by verse to the book of Mark. Today, we find ourselves here. Uh, because in Mark chapter 1, we're introduced to someone. In fact, if the Jews had a yearbook, he would be Mr. Superlative. He would be most likely to succeed. He would be the one everyone would know about. Even Christ said about him that, that there is no one born of woman greater than him. He was handpicked by God to tell his people that Christ is on the way. In fact, at one point, his fame rivaled that of Jesus. And Similarly, so this important person has now vanished from the scene. It's as if we've closed the yearbook on him. Talk about the man they call John the Baptist. Anybody heard from John lately? <laughs> well, John's right there, but John, good to see you, John. But we haven't heard much from John the Baptist. But the cool part is, though we have not heard much from John the Baptist, his message has never changed. Though we have not heard much from John the Baptist, his message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came, who left heaven to come down to earth to now forgive us of our sins, that message has never left. Speaking about things missing, uh, if you ask my wife, I'm the king of missing stuff. I lose everything. I lost my keys one time in Ikea. For four hours, I'm trying to search for them bad boys. I've lost my keys at church, but I found them. But there's one thing I pray you and I never lose. We never misplace the eagerness and boldness to tell the watching world about Jesus Christ. I pray you and I never lose that. And today, John the Baptist wants to show us what it means to live for truth in a broken world. Now, I know all of us desire to share our faith, right? But if we can be honest, including me, there's many times where God has given me the moment and I've been afraid. I've cowered away, okay? So hear me, there's grace for all of us. But this is what I want to remind you of this, that that moment shall come back again. And this is why I want you to lean in. In fact, do me a favor, lean in towards me. Sit up, lean in. Okay, y'all listen, we'll try it again. One, two, three, lean in. Because hear me, the word is dying. They have no hope. And we have the message of life. How selfish of us just because we got our seat on the bus to watch those walk by destined for life apart from Jesus. Lean in with me today. Um, John wants to teach us what it means to really live for truth. 
So if I had to sum up my sermon today, I would say it like this. As Jesus followers, we have the privilege and responsibility to tell and show others the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it comes at a great price. Today we'll be in Mark chapter 6. In fact, you can turn down to Mark chapter 6, verse 14. And I want to show you three important things about truth. But before we get there, if you like drama, you came to the right service. I got a story for you today that is full of drama. If you are a seasoned saint, it's like you put murder she wrote matched with all my children. Uh, if you are a millennial like me, it's like Mari meets Jerry Springer. And if you are a Generation Z, it's pretty much every show you watch on TV. You know what I'm saying? But today is the day of drama, man. If you like a soap opera, today is your day to come to church. The Bible is boring. You'll see it's not. Okay, now, every good soap opera, you have to understand the characters, right? So let me introduce you now to the characters, okay? Herod the Great, we meet him in Matthew chapter 2, okay? It's where Jesus and his parents, Mary and Joseph, fled to Africa, to Egypt, because he was trying to kill all the newborn babies up to two years old. Now, Herod had multiple sons, but I only want to show you three. And this is where the drama happens. You ready? Here we go. Now, you had Herod Antipas, Herod Aristobulus, and Herod Philip. These are all his sons. They all share the same first name. Now, Herod Aristobulus, he had a daughter named Herodias. All right, here it goes. Herodias had a thing for her uncle. And her uncle had a thing for her. And the two got married. Okay, really, y'all? Okay, don't worry about it. Okay, I'll <laughs> You just wait. You just wait. Don't worry about it. Now, they had a daughter named uh, Salem May, and we'll get back to her. But here's the kicker. This is the Herod we'll talk about in our text today. And this Herod was already married. But this Herod had a thing for his niece slash sister-in-law. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so here it is. He convinces her to divorce divorce her husband slash uncle so that, she, so that he could, so she could marry him. Uh-huh, I told you. I try to tell you. Now, but the most important character in this saga here is John the Baptist. See, in Mark chapter 1, we're told of John the Baptist. But if we don't put him here, Mark does not put him in this text here, we have no idea what happened to him. So now that we're all caught up in the, as the world turns, Pick me up in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 14. It says this. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John has been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man and kept him safe. When Herod heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give it to you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? She said, the head of John the Baptist. She came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was exceedingly sorry, but because his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. Our first point is of truth is that truth is countercultural. Verse 14 and 15, Christ's ministry is growing, okay? It's multiplying. Even his disciples are now healing people and causing people good, good fortune. 
And this word gets back now to Herod. And those around Herod, they say, well, he must be Elijah. He must be an Old Testament prophet. But in verse 16, it's as if Herod goes, shh, no, it's not Elijah or prophet. It's John the Baptist, whom I beheaded, has come back to life. In this moment, something hits Herod. It was not that. <laughs> what hits Herod is his guilt. Herod knew that what he did was wrong. Now, we've all been there, right? Did something no one else saw. Thought you got away with it. But you heard that voice or saw that face and it rushed back to you what you did. That's Herod now. He's hit with his guilt. And the guilt lays on him so much, he incriminates himself. He says, John, whom I beheaded. He puts himself in mental prison. In fact, the language here is graphic because the I in, in, in this text is what they call emphatic. It meant that he kept, he kept saying it and saying it and saying it. I killed John. I beheaded him. You know what's interesting? A guilty conscience needs no accuser but itself. Guilt has a way of coming back on you. And that's where John, that's where Herod finds himself now. Now, in verse 17, Mark puts us now to behind the scenes of the story. He tells us that what happens here is because of this. And in verse 17, the big issue is John the Baptist cannot keep his mouth shut. John the Baptist could not mind his own business. He's been telling those around the town that Herod, you're wrong for marrying your brother's wife. Herod's wife is not like this, and so she wants to kill John. In fact, scholars say that this was not John's only one-time sermon he did this. No, he did it over and over and over again. Some scholars say that he even told Herod to his face. Now, what does John get this boldness from, this courage? It's here where John shows us what it means to be countercultural, meaning John stood for truth when everyone else was standing for lies. If you are a Christian, I want to remind you of something. You are called to stand for truth because the world says that Christ is a way, but we say that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Hear me. If you are a Christian... You are called to be countercultural. If the world is walking this way, because of our faith, we pivot and go this way. And as we're walking, the world walks by us, we stop and say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, praying that someone will come and follow us. Now, where does John get this boldness from? Well, in Mark chapter 1, we're introduced to John. We find him in the desert. In the desert, I believe that it's where John developed a deep intimacy for God. It's there where he developed a good sense of right and wrong, a moral conscience, courage and boldness. I'll say it this way. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more countercultural you will be. That's why Pastor Scott is preaching constantly about read your Bible, pray to God, fast, get away from the noise. Why? Because the more you and I spend with God, the more we actually pivot from the world. And if we're going to be countercultural, to tell the world who Christ is, hear me, we cannot always be afraid to tell the truth. Now, when I say countercultural, it, it, it defines it this way in the dictionary. A way of life and a set of attitudes opposed to the prevailing social norm. C.S. Lewis would say it this way. You can't go against the grain of the universe and not expect to get splinters. If you or I are going to tell the world about Jesus... You can't always be afraid. Now, I need to be honest with you. As your brother, as your pastor, as one of your pastors, I sometimes struggle with telling people about Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you. There's grace for us. I sometimes struggle with telling people about Christ because I'm so concerned about how they will view me. But John shows us the remedy to people pleasing in this in verse 18, it's his love for God. 
John loved God so much, he was only concerned about what God thought and less concerned about what other people thought. And if you or I are going to be Christians who tell the truth, we cannot always be so concerned about how other people will view us. I'll say it this way. You and I must get ourselves out of the center of our Christianity. It's not about us. But it's about him. You hear me? I'm saying it to you as your brother. I know what it feels like to be afraid to tell people about Jesus. But hear me. That is because I'm making it all about me. And the gospel is not about me. It's about what Christ has done. Y'all with me? Look, y'all quiet. Somebody in this section, say amen. amen. Now, there have been times where I've had to really go to Scripture memory to help me with my people pleasing. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, I'm a servant of Christ, not a servant of man. Paul says, I'm only concerned about how God views me, not other people. John 3.30, this John would say that he must increase that I might decrease. John is saying, I'm only concerned about how Christ views me. Hear me. You and I must have an audience of one. We have to be primarily concerned about how God views us, not other people. And let me say this. As you're sharing the truth about Christ Jesus, don't be rude. Don't be mean. Christ was not mean to you. Amen. You go ahead, ma'am. You let that thing run. But seriously, what breaks my heart is Christians are so dogmatic about truth and yet are mean to people. But to get back to the text here, the question still remains, do we love people enough to tell them the truth? Do we love people enough to tell them that I'm pushing through the awkwardness, I'm pushing through the fear to tell you that somebody left heaven to come down to earth to put on my sin just so I can be brought back to God? That's called good news, that I'm willing to push through my awkwardness because Jesus Christ is that important. In fact, I don't know other way to say it than to say it from Charles Spurgeon, but hear me, before I put it up on the screen, let this quote, sit with you. Feel the weight of what we're about to read. He says this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let no one go unwarned and ungrateful. Have we forgotten that we are called to be a city on a hill, a light in a dark place, the salt of the earth? This is why you are here. You are here to tell the world of who Christ is, because without him, they have no hope. This is why we are here. John says, I was willing to be countercultural because the gospel message was that important. John shows us here, man. John might have lost his head, but his message never left. Herod kept his head, but lost his soul. We're called to tell the world about Jesus. Um, in May 2011, I married my beautiful, I'm sorry, I was engaged to my beautiful wife. I asked her to marry me. And praise God, Miss Pam, she said yes, because I was a little nervous. You got a little wobbly when you get down there. You got to be careful. You got to do, do your lunges, do your lunges. Um, she said yes, man. And so I remember calling my dad. And at that time, my dad didn't have the best view of marriage. I knew that. But I still wanted to call and say, Dad, the son got engaged. My dad said something to me that still rocks me to this day. He said, son, that's your decision. Doesn't matter how I feel, you have to live with that choice. Before you castigate my father, he taught me something very valuable. Everyone is not going to always be enthusiastic about what you're enthusiastic about. Everyone's not going to always hug and jump in your arms because you talk about Jesus. Hear me. But that day I also taught my dad something. 
I was so in love with my wife, she had all of my heart that I could not help but talk about her. Meaning, just because you don't want to hear it, that does not mean I will stop saying it. And this is what I desire for us to be as Christians. What happened to the love you had for Jesus? Well, all you knew was him, and all you, and all you knew that, was that he loved you and that you loved him. You didn't know much, but you knew that somebody died for you, and you were so in love with him, you could not help but talk about him. What happened to us? Pastor Tritton, in all of our theology, we become prideful. The purpose of theology is to worship God. The purpose of studying your Bible is to talk about King Jesus. The purpose of mission trips is all about King Jesus. I'm going to ask you a simple question. What happened to that innocent love you used to have? This is what it means to tell the truth and be countercultural. John shows us this in this first beginning of this text, that it was his love for God, that he was willing to go against the grain to tell the world the truth of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm sweating up here, man. Listen, y'all need to help me out. All right. Our next point is truth is compelling. Verse 20 says, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed and yet heard him gladly. Um, ever had that person in your life who has no problem with telling you your, your issues? Rosie? Uh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. T, I'm in trouble. And yet, even though you, it makes you so frustrated, something inside you goes, but I still need to hear it. That's kind of what's going on here. John's been saying, Herod. You got a pocket, man. You have married your brother's wife. You would think that Herod would be like, I'm done with you, John. Close the prison, shut the door. But it's as if Herod says, leave the door cracked. I don't want to hear it, but I kind of need to hear it. Why is that? Because truth is compelling. You do realize that the reason you sit here it's because someone kept telling you the truth. You're only here because someone will not shut up about Jesus. You do realize that the only reason you are here is because somebody kept telling you over and over and over again about Jesus. And now you can't stop telling people over and over and over again about Jesus. It says that... Um, that he feared John. I believe that Herod had a great respect for John. I think in this moment in the text, Herod sees John for who he is. He's a holy man, a righteous man. I find it interesting here that not only was he holy and righteous, but the words that John was saying to Herod is as if it kept drawing Herod to John. Truth has a way of getting in your mind and grabbing your heart. That's what's going on here. Something's going on in Herod where he just can't explain it, but something is getting him all wrapped up into wanting to hear the truth. Now, it also says this, that he was perplexed and yet heard him greatly. Now, this is interesting to me. How in the world are you confused and yet you're still glad? He's perplexed and yet hearing somebody greatly. I don't know what I'm hearing, but I'm glad I'm hearing it. What? That's confusing. He's happy he's hearing what he's hearing, but he has no idea what he's hearing. Why? Because truth is compelling. Truth has a way of getting in your bones when you don't want to turn around. Um, and so, in fact, I believe that Herod had a great respect for John. So much so that... Um, he kept John safe from his own wife. And not only that, but um, what blows my mind is, is, is simply this, that, that Herod had respect for John because John was a truth teller. Herod, Herod is a ruler, right? So that, that means that he's surrounded by what they call yes men. Anybody know about yes men? Right, right. 
But John was the only person who was countercultural. He told Herod the truth even when he didn't want to hear it. Can I just tell you something right quick for free? As people of God, can we not gossip behind people's back? But tell them the truth in their faces with love? John was willing to tell Herod the truth even if it cost him something. Let's be a church that does not gossip behind our backs. But tells the truth to our faces. Now, um, thank you for that one clap, sir. Um, now, scholars say that Herod was around John so much that he possibly could have begun to change his life. He could have begun to actually repent from, 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 from some of his sins. But there was one sin that Herod was not going to give up of the marriage. It was one sin that Herod said, I, I'll do this, John, but don't touch that. I've been a pastor for a little while now. Um, I'm getting gray, getting old. My back hurts. My knees hurt. Lord have mercy. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've been around the block, and what I've learned is people love good sermons just as long as you don't touch the sin that they love the most. <laughs> pastor Ricky, keep preaching about missions. I like that. <laughs> Preach about discipleship. Oh, I like that. But don't you dare talk about forgiveness. Don't you dare talk about how I spend my money. <laughs> now look, I'm, I'm on the clock, I'm on the clock, I'm on the clock. Um, uh, and then lastly, don't you dare talk about injustice. We have things in our life that we go, I'm just cool with that, Pastor Rick. I think what Herod shows us is simply that partial obedience is no obedience. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter. Her name is Ryan. That's my baby girl. But that girl is disobedient. <laughs> she gets it from my mama. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so one day we're playing in the front yard, man, and, and, and there's like a main street that runs kind of through our front yard, our front uh, yard there. And, and I say, Ryan, hey, baby, you're getting close to the street. Come back. She looks at me and, <laughs> Ryan, baby girl, come back. <laughs> Ryan, baby girl, come back. Now, here's the cool part about it. My daughter never verbally d disobeyed me, but she just showed it with her feet. Christians, we never will say, God, I just won't do that. you'll show it <laughs> with your feet. Son, don't watch that website. <laughs> Daughter, I've told you again that man is not good for you. <laughs> Son, you keep coming to church and coming to church and coming to church, and yet you're still choosing not to hear me. There's a way to disobey God without ever opening your mouth. Christians vote not by their mouth, but with their feet. What's the area in your life you're just okay with partial obedience? What's the area in your life, if you're honest, you spend more time going? Got to keep going. Um. But this is where Herod is right now. He is what they call perplexed. As if he's saying, what do I do with what I'm hearing? I love this because what it shows is that truth is really compelling. Something in Herod is beginning to work so much so that he's beginning to second guess his lifestyle. Hear me. This is why I want to encourage you with this. I, I, I want to say it this way just to let you know that it's just, it's just important. As Jesus' followers share the truth, we can rest that our work is not in vain there is often more going on than meets the eye. Hear me. If you are a parent in here right now and your child is acting plum crazy, don't you stop talking about Jesus to them. If you have a spouse that is not a Christian, just because they don't want to hear it, please do not stop sharing it. Why? You have no idea how God is using your words to draw them to yourself. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 11, God says, my word should not come back void. 
Don't stop sharing your faith. You have no idea what is going on in people's hearts just because you cannot see it. That does not mean that God is not working. In fact, I'll say it this way. No one can stop the spread of God's word. You keep telling it. You watch it work. And proof of that is you. How many folks kept telling you about Jesus and you didn't want to hear it? Didn't want to hear it. Didn't want to hear it. And now you find yourself being a Christian. All because someone did not stop telling you about who God is. Truth is compelling. All right, now, my last point. You might, you might not like me after this point, but it's okay. It's okay. All right, I'm concerned about how God views, not how you view me. All right. The last one is truth is costly. It's going to cost you something. And my fear is that we've create a new Christianity that says, I can just live in my comforts and not cost me anything. I just don't see that in the Bible. As you stand for Jesus, whether you are a kid or an adult, it will cost you something. Verse 21, it says that an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and his military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. Now, now we're back to the soap opera, as the world turns. Come on back with me. Come on. Come on. Now's the time. We have not heard much from Herodias, okay, Herod's wife. But last time we heard of her, she was trying to kill John. And now is her time to get what she's wanted. Now is the time where she draws us back into the story. Now, Herodias knew that, John, uh, that Herod's birthdays were full of drinking. So she knew that her husband would be under the influence. So whatever she asked of him, more than likely, he would say yes because he was under the influence. And now this is where we bring back into the story. In verse 22, it says, Herodias' daughter danced for them. Now let me say this. This is no 10-year-old recital dancing, okay? <laughs> Not to be too graphic. But this is seductive dancing. And I want you to feel the weight of what I'm about to say. This man is watching his daughter please him and other grown men. The depths of sin. You know, what's, you know what's crazy? That's just not happening in the Bible. That also could happen in our own city. So wake up. Okay? Wake up. It says that she danced for them, and it pleased him so much that he told her, in verse 23, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Now, this is crazy. He, he was so pleased. He said, whatever you, want to, whatever you ask of me, I will give it to you. And it says that she runs to her mother and says, well, what should I ask for? And this is where verse 21 comes into play. Herodias says, give me John's head. She runs back to Herod and says, I want John's head, but I want it on a platter. Now, her mother never said anything about a platter. But this was the hatred they had for John. You embarrass me and my mama, I'm going to embarrass you. Feel that. Read your Bible and see emotional context. The depths of sin. They hated John because he simply told the truth. Truth is costly. In fact, I'll, I'll say it this way. A guilty conscience does not try to hear the truth, but rather silence it. When people are faced with God's truth, they must either repent or feel compelled to silence the message. They hated him so much that his head was worth more than his, kingdom, than his kingdom. Hear me. For those of you right now who someone has wronged you, be careful of how you hate because it can ruin you. Truth is costly. 
John's about to lose his head because he simply told the truth of God. Hear me. If we are going to talk about Jesus, it will come at a cost. One of my favorite heroes is a doc, guy named Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. 1958, you know, he was in Harlem, New York, doing a book signing, and a lady approached him. He said, ma'am, how can I help you? And she pulled out a pen and stabbed him in the chest. Crazy part is, when you see pictures of Dr. King, he's always in a suit and tie. You can't see the scar. But hear me. Just because you can't see the scar does not mean that we won't bear scars. If you talk about Christ Jesus enough, you will bear some scars. I pray they are not physical. They could be mental, emotional, spiritual. Hear me. If you and I talk about Christ Jesus enough, we will bear some scars. And this is my fear, that you and I have created now a new way of telling the truth where we want it all nice and cozy. But that's just not how it goes. In fact, I'm going to put some Bible on that from Pastor Scott, what he always says. John 15, 20, it says this. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Crawford Loritz says it this way. Don't be surprised that the gospel has a tendency of getting us in trouble. Just know, hear me, that it comes at a cost to talk about Jesus. But there is some trouble that I'm okay to get in. It's what they call good trouble. A man named uh, John Lewis, a congressman from Georgia who fought with Dr. King, would coin this term, good trouble, because he said, there's just some trouble worth getting in. And this is what I ask of you, Hope Church, that we should be filled with folks who don't mind getting in good trouble, meaning I don't mind talking about Christ Jesus even if it may cost me something. <laughs> be people who share good truth and get in good trouble. This is what we are called to be. Now, to end our time, Herod had the opportunity now to do what was right, but he didn't. He beheaded John. And the main reason was he was more concerned about what his friends would think. What makes me sad in verse 27 is there's somebody in this room right now. God's been probing at your heart but you are more concerned with those around you that you will not accept what Christ is doing. What breaks my heart is folks will miss out on salvation all because they are more concerned about what their friends and family will think. Don't do this. This is your time. John says, I have lived for truth. I have died for truth. This was so precious to John that he gave his life to it. God simply says this, I came to give life and life to the full. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't know Christ Jesus, please come to him. Story of a young boy one day began to cry because he was lost. A man said, son, where is your home? He said, sir, I, I, I don't know. All I can remember is there's a building with a cross on it. The man began to smile and he said, I know exactly what that building is. That building was a church. To that boy now, to, to, to that building where the cross was at, and the boy was able to find his way home. More of the story is simply this. When the boy found the cross, he found home. This is my prayer for you right now. Some of you right now do not know Jesus. Hope Church, do you not realize that there's a cross on top of our building? That means that we were sent here to look for those who are lost to bring them now to Christ Jesus. There's a cross on top of your building. Simply means we have been called to tell Las Vegas, the West, and the world about the one who saves sinner's soul. This is what we're called to do. But this is not the last time we will see Herod. In Luke 23, Christ is heading towards the cross. He sees and meets Herod. Herod asked him, do me a miracle. Christ says, nothing. His silence communicates, you have ran out of opportunity. There is no hope for your soul. What, what, what brings me to fear is, truth 
is timely. Meaning, you don't know when God will say, give me back my breath. And when that time comes, it is too late to choose him. If you don't know Jesus, I am begging you, come to him before he says, time is up. How long will you sit in church and hear a good sermon after good sermon? Good music after good music, good quote after good quote, and simply walk out of here and say, I have nothing to do with this Jesus. Christ says, be careful. He also says, I'm, I'm a gracious God. I'm not angry with you. I'm not mad at you. I'm simply saying, I came to give life. Please come to me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Opportunity, God, to share your word. And my prayer is that simply we have lifted you up, that you will draw all men to yourself. Save somebody's soul, Christ Jesus. Please help us to know what it means to live a bold, courageous life for the gospel. In Christ's name, amen. If you're a Christian, I have two things for you, and then I'm out your way. The first thing is, would you ask God to just restore the joy of your salvation? To bring you back when you used to fall, when you used to love him. You didn't know much, but you just knew that he loved you. And you couldn't help but talk about him. Talk about him. Ask God to bring that, that fervor back to your life. And secondly, don't be afraid to be courageous. John lived for truth. And John died for truth. Don't be afraid to open your mouth, push through the awkwardness and say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you're not a Christian, as our pastors come, I would love to introduce you to the one who gave everything for you. He died for you so that you could live, and he did it for free. Hear me, the gospel is free, but it's not cheap. Somebody died so you could live. The gospel is good news, but only if you get it in time. So as our worship team begins to come and our pastors are here, we begin to sing. If God is impressing on your heart that you don't know him and he's working in your heart, we would love to introduce you to this Jesus. Also, if you need prayer and just asking God to revitalize your heart, to bring back that passion, to share your faith, we would love to pray for you. Let's stand, and as we begin to sing, that is your cue to come.